At the time of this recording, parent company Paradox Interactive has effectively gutted the White Wolf label after repeated non-traversies that got certain ideologues up in a tiffy. Now, given how critical I've been of Onyx Path Publishing over the years, it comes off as no surprise that I didn't care for Exalted 3rd Edition. To be fair, I wanted to get excited for it. I legitimately did. And putting aside the drama surrounding the publisher, which I've already covered, the ultimate problem I had with the game is that it completely misunderstood what made Exalted special. The ultimate demonstration of this is when they said Exalted is Wuxia and Mythology, in response to the lack of Magitek in the core book. While it technically can be about those things, it's like saying Star Wars films are family films. Technically true, but completely misleading. But if there's anything I've made clear over the past two or so years, is that when you shit the bed, someone else will come in to fill that void. This is where Godbound comes in, being treated as an exalted alternative with a few toes dipped into the 20-sided dice. Does it live up to that position, or does it melt under the sun? Let's find out. While Godbound's page setup isn't excessively ornate, it definitely has a strong sense of visual identity. Exalted maintained that kind of visual identity through consistent art styles. Godbound does this through contrast in color. There's a sense of color being tied to supernatural power, through the art and through some of the text. Whilst a bit compressed in places, there's not a lot of bad in the presentation. It's a solid piece overall. Much like Exalted 2nd Edition, we'll be going with Albert Galan once again, with the same concept of a crusading monk. The first three steps concern attributes, which use the familiar six scores seen in D20 proper. These attributes are generated, of course, by rolling 4d6 and dropping the lowest one six times. After assigning these scores, we get the following. Strength 17, Dexterity 18, Constitution 16, Wisdom 15, Intelligence 12, and Charisma 11. This determines the modifiers for each, which is akin to modifiers seen in most OSR games. Respectively, the modifiers are plus 2, plus 3, plus 2, plus 1, and 2 plus zeros. Lastly, the attribute check number that each character has to pass when rolling said check. This is determined by subtracting 21 from each attribute score. In this case, 4, 3, 5, 6, 9, and 10. Next comes the character's facts, three defining aspects of that character's background. This is not too far removed from the backgrounds in 13th Age, which I'll get to in the future, as facts grant a plus 4 bonus to relevant roles. In this case, one fact is tied to background, one to their past career before awakening, and a past defining relationship. In Albert's case, we'll go with his origin being Thorns, past career is Warrior Monk, and his relationship is Head of the Golden Ray Cult. Thirdly, Words, which determine the divine abilities that a Godbound possesses. Of the words available, we can pick three. In this case, we'll go with Sun, Sword, and Alacrity. Each of these words gains an innate advantage before any divine gifts. In this case, Alacrity makes it impossible to be surprised, Sun lets us emit light at 200 feet, and Sword makes any weapon or unarmed attack be treated as magical. Fourth step is Divine Gifts, Godbound's relative equivalent to Charms. While you have six points to spend on lesser or greater Divine Gifts, within the aforementioned words, there's multiple ways to do so. A lesser gift costs one point, a greater one costs two, and three points can be spent to gain access to another word. We'll be spending these points on the following gifts. Walk Between the Rain, The Storm Breaks, Body of Burning Light, Hope of the Dawn, Steel Without End, and Nine Iron Walls. Next is Saving Throws. These are calculated by subtracting 15 from the higher of two ability modifiers. Hardiness is based on either Strength or Constitution. Evasion is based on either Dexterity or Intelligence and Spirit is based on either Wisdom or Charisma. This makes Albert's saving throws 13, 12, and 14, respectively. Next is Weapons and Armor. In this particular case, we'll only go with Unarmed and Unarmored, given the Divine Gifts chosen earlier. This makes his Unarmed Attack 1d10 plus 4, and his AC to be 3. He also has a Fray Die of 1d8, which represents his damage against Mook-type enemies. Lastly, the remaining derived stats. Hit points start at 8, plus the character's Constitution modifier, so Albert's hit points is 10. Effort is akin to Essence from Exalted and is the second part, which starts at 2. And finally, a Godbound starts with 2 Influence. Influence is essentially a character's social points. Character creation is pretty simple, with a minimal amount of crunch compared to Exalted proper. I do like the game isn't limiting itself by its D20 ancestry. Just like in the other D20 games I've enjoyed, there's an emphasis on descriptiveness without going full fluff. 
My only nitpick here is how the game handles weapons. I understand why it's done this way, but I think they swung the pendulum too far the other way with the very limited amount of weapon types. Either way, you're definitely as powerful mechanically as a game called Godbound should be. Godbound's core mechanics are mostly similar to most D20 games, but there's a few aspects that might throw you off if you're looking at this from a traditional perspective. For starters, the attribute checks aren't based on the modifiers versus the target set number, but based on their check value shown before. Saving throws work similarly. Instead of either doing a roll under setup, combat has similar quirks. As armor class is not a target to overcome, instead you add your d20 roll, attack bonus, and the target's armor class together. If the total is at least 20, the attack hits. Furthermore, damage isn't directly tied to the damage die result, but instead ranges between 0 and 4 depending on the die result. It's a great way to avoid damage spiking and ridiculous amounts of math. This simplicity also falls into the use of divine gifts. While some of them are activated automatically, the ones that aren't use effort. But instead of spending effort like a traditional resource, you commit it, as if you're allocating a resource to a pot, but it's not lost in the process. You can undo this commitment to place it in another one, and thus more effort means you can commit more power to more gifts. When it comes to resources, this is split into three aspects. The first is wealth, an abstraction of your income that's not necessarily tied to your facts. Influence and dominion, the latter of which I mentioned before, can be used to change the facts of other people or places. The latter is intended to be a more permanent affair. Furthermore, expenditure of dominion is as important as experience when it comes to a godbound's development, as if you're literally building your legend. All of this helps to highlight the overall theme of the larger-than-life heroes committing epic deeds that bards would sing about. Even with that goal, I do appreciate that the game doesn't overdo its crunch. As I said before, the weapon system could use some expansion, and I will keep holding to that. It certainly doesn't encompass some of the mechanics present in Exalted, but it's a solid foundation to expand upon. If there's one thing that impressed me with Godbound, it's how it maintains the essence of heroic fantasy while maintaining mechanical simplicity. However, unlike the world's most popular role-playing game, this simplicity does not come at the expense of player expression. I once again have to eat my humble pie, as this is technically an OSR game in terms of its intent, but it doesn't feel like it due to not worshipping the old school at the genre's expense. Godbound is a toolbox for the game's motifs, since it's not as linked to the setting the way a White Wolf game is. Because of what's present, however, and with potential inherent in it, I feel confident in giving this game a stamp of strongly recommended. While the free version is particularly solid, the deluxe version is a far stronger demonstration of the game's potential, in my opinion. While I can recommend it easily to those who like their fantasy to have a mythological bent, I can doubly recommend it to fans of Exalted. While not having things like Solars, Essence, The Great Curse, etc., it carries the same feel as the game with a far more optimized set of mechanics. In fact, that's the best way to describe it. This is a game that is optimized for its style of play, rather than being more simplified. I'd also be remiss if I did not mention the conversion material created by Sponsored by Nobody, so those who are longtime Exalted players have all the more reason to jump in. If there's any lesson between these two reviews, it's that when one entry fails, someone else will step in to fill that niche. It's far more rewarding to find the one that does than to lament the loss of the pillar.